On May 1st, 1915, the Lusitania left New York for her week-long crossing to Liverpool, England. Friends waved goodbyes on what they thought would be a routine voyage. But it wasn't. The journey ended in the tragic death of more than 1,000 Americans. Was the sinking of the Lusitania an unprovoked act of war? Why did the unsinkable ship go down so quickly? Public opinion ran high as the blame was laid squarely on Germany. But was the German Navy solely responsible? High society gathered at New York's dockside to bid farewell to the Lusitania. Passengers paid little regard to company leaflets warning them of German U-boats in the Atlantic. Crowds waved goodbye to 1,959 people. Among the passengers was the millionaire Alfred Vanderbilt. The Lusitania was the largest, the fastest, and the most luxurious ship of her time. With a top speed of nearly 26 knots, she had recaptured the blue ribbon from her German rivals. Now, ostensibly to save fuel, one of her four turbines had been shut down. It caused a reduction of speed that would put her at a fatal disadvantage if she was forced to outsail a hostile German ship. It did not seem to matter. The United States was neutral. It was unthinkable for the Lusitania to be attacked. Passengers relaxed in the splendor of the lavishly furnished staterooms. The weather on the journey across was splendid. German U-boats had a limited range, and for the first six days, no danger threatened. As her route took her around the coast of Southern Ireland, however, the Lusitania entered the war zone. Normally, the Royal Navy escorted any ship carrying cargo. Even cargo of mules earlier had warranted three destroyers and an armed cruiser. Yet the Lusitania, with its VIP passengers, was sailing the course alone. There had been warnings. And advertisement of the Lusitania's sailing times was accompanied by a notice from the German embassy advising passengers that they traveled at their own risk. German U-boats freely roamed the high seas and scored some spectacular successes. Moreover, a single German U-boat was known to be active in the war zone, which was part of the Lusitania's path. It was commanded by a Captain Schweiger, who had once attacked a hospital ship without warning. During the 30 hours before the Lusitania's arrival, he had sunk three vessels off the Irish coast, two of them substantial merchant ships. To sink them, he had to use up all but one of his torpedoes. As he awaited the Lusitania, he surfaced to regenerate his batteries, and his crew relaxed in the warm spring sunshine. He had no real hope of sinking the great liner, but equally, he was in no great danger. No armed ships from the British Navy were around to harass him. Off the old head of Kinsale, he again submerged, waiting beneath the calm waters. An hour later, the Lusitania was sighted. The fateful meeting was about to take place.
For survivor Mrs. Avis Foley, a 12-year-old girl who had been traveling alone to school in England, disaster struck with unexpected suddenness. We were enjoying a delicious lunch, which was simply marvelous. The meals were all marvelous on the boat, when suddenly the whole boat was shaken by a tremendous blow. Some people say there were two torpedoes, but my recollection is that there was only one. Oh, I must have been at the wheel almost half an hour, and I heard the lookout my shelf. This is torpedo coming on the starboard bow, sir. Well, it no sooner said starboard bow, sir, than that was it. And it must have been, it must have hit a very close behind the bridge because uh, we couldn't see one another for quite a while, for coal dust and one thing and another, and everybody thought he was going straight over. And the water started to come over the starboard wing of the bridge, and the captain said, save yourself. She was listing over to the starboard side pretty steeply, and uh, I was going to get in the, uh, this, uh, this boat here, like, or standing by it, when the fellow got excited and... He was lowering his side down, and the other fellow either couldn't release the ropes, like, tangled, uh, and the, I saw all the people emptied into the water. This fellow got panicky and lowered down, and they emptied the people into the water. That was the next boat, to, the one I got in, number 13. The Lusitania was thought to be unsinkable. She went down, however, with appalling swiftness. 18 minutes in some accounts, 21 minutes in others. For many families, there was not time to find relatives. I don't know how long I was in the water on the wreckage, but when I came to, there was a crowd uh, around me and they were pumping water from me. And next thing, they give me a cup of tea and put a blanket round me. When I went along this dock road, they were making marjories in the heat shop with their white sheets on and bodies lying on the shop floors. Then uh, from there, I went round thinking I could see my father and into London Road where I lived. When I got home, the, it seems my mother was down at Lamb Street with a baby. The shock of the tragedy was felt on both sides of the Atlantic. 1,201 men, women and children died. For several days, crowds lingered at the railway station in Liverpool, where survivors were brought, hoping against all odds that a familiar face would be among them. Most were disappointed. In Ireland, mass graves were dug for victims whose bodies had been washed ashore and could not be identified. The inquest accused the Germans of committing willful murder. No awkward questions were asked about why the Lusitania had sunk so quickly, or why only 700 people had been saved. The English newspapers concentrated the blame entirely upon the Germans. Public opinion in Britain and the United States fueled reasons for involvement in World War I. Headlines proclaimed the Germans abandoned their right to be called civilized. Violent mobs demonstrated against the Germans and broke up shops owned by German nationals. Gradually, questions began to appear. Why was the Lusitania left apparently unescorted through dangerous waters? Why did she sink so quickly? After the sinking of the Lusitania, local boats worked non-stop bringing survivors and bodies to Queenstown, where high street shops were turned into improvised mortuaries. The dockyard has been long deserted by the British Navy.
the old courthouse where the coroner condemned the Germans still stands. Close by is a monument to the victims of the German attack. But the greatest reminder of all, the Lusitania, lies south of Queenstown, 315 feet down. After she was sunk, further questions were asked. Why was there no escort? How could such an enormous vessel as the Lusitania be sunk by a single torpedo? Later in the war, a sister ship was struck by no less than 12 torpedoes and still managed to sail to port. For nearly 50 years, the mystery of why the Lusitania sank so quickly lay hidden on the seabed. Then, a team of divers, led by the American John Light, penetrated the murky waters. They brought back photographic evidence of what happened. In 1960, I first came here to dive on the Lusitania. Between 1960 and 1962, I made 37 dives to her personally. And with the divers that were with me, we made 109 dives altogether. The divers found the vessel split in half. John Light made a further discovery, which reveals much about the secret cargo aboard the Lusitania. She does have, however, another split, which is caused by an internal explosion that starts on this side of the ship, just underneath the bridge, and goes down on an angle forward. And as it goes down, it opens out. And the bottom of the ship is pretty well blasted away. Now we can conclude from this that this is an extension of the explosion that occurred by the torpedo hitting the other side of the ship. The bow itself is twisted, and it's twisted nearly off. But your plates buckle outwards, and there can be no doubt that an internal explosion is what caused her to sink. What could have caused such a gigantic explosion? Colin Simpson. The reason why the Lusitania sunk when she was hit by one torpedo um, is no longer a mystery. The Lusitania was being used to carry contraband from North America to England. There is no doubt from the ship's manifest that it was a cargo of explosives. She was loaded with shells, with shell fuses, with a type of gun cotton called pyroloxene, and it was all hidden up in the forward holes. Before she was allowed to leave New York, under American neutrality laws, she had to submit a manifest, that's a, a list of what she was carrying, to the harbor authorities. She submitted a forgery, and the American authorities, full knowing it was a forgery, accepted it. But a true war manifest was also made, and it was locked away. When the torpedo hit, it hit the exact hole, it's called the Orlop hole, where the gun cotton was stowed. And the, the torpedo just made a lot of noise, and the gun cotton blew her bottom out. She sank in 21 minutes. U.S. knowledge of the explosives on board is revealed by a confidential White House memorandum. President Wilson asked Deputy Secretary Robert Lansing were any contraband munitions aboard the Lusitania when torpedoed? Lansing replied, practically all her cargo was contraband of some kind. The British Admiralty ordered authorities in Ireland, ensure that bodies selected for inquest have not been killed or mutilated by means which we do not wish made public. So there was a monumental Anglo-American cover-up was at the highest level involving Winston Churchill on the English side and Franklin D. Roosevelt, then Secretary of State for the Navy on the American side. There's little doubt the American Secretary of State and his deputy both knew the true story. The cover-up had to survive two separate inquiries, one in England and one in New York. Both judges were ordered to suppress certain evidence and keep secret certain papers. The suppressed documents reveal that Captain William Turner, master of the Lusitania, was to be made the scapegoat. From the British Admiralty came the message, 
I am directed to inform you that it is considered politically expedient that Captain Turner be most prominently blamed for the disaster. Winston Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, agreed. He said, I consider the Admiralty case against the Captain should be pressed by a skillful counsel. From Lord Fisher, Captain Turner of the Lusitania is a scoundrel and has been bribed. The master of the Lusitania acted directly contrary to the written general instructions received from Queenstown during the hours immediately preceding the attack. On the facts at present disclosed, the master appears to have displayed an almost inconceivable negligence and one is forced to conclude that he is either utterly incompetent or has been got at by the Germans. Sir Edward Grey, Foreign Secretary, underlined the official approach. He said, Captain Turner was fully informed of the presence of hostile submarines in the vicinity of the place in which he was torpedoed. The inquiry was told the captain recklessly took the unarmed Lusitania into a danger area. The Lusitania was deliberately sent into a hazardous area where there was a German U-boat without escorts and with a dangerous cargo. And the tragedy could have been avoided. The Lusitania was designed as an armed cruiser. The archives of the National Maritime Museum clearly hold the drawings showing that she was designed to carry 12 six-inch guns. The guns were actually fitted on May the 13th, 1913. Churchill had the thought of the Lusitania being attacked by the Germans very much on his mind. He commissioned a paper on the political repercussions in the event of the Lusitania being sunk by a German submarine five weeks before this happened. That morning, as the Lusitania approached the old head of Kinsale. The King of England had seen the American ambassador, had said to him, what will happen if the Lusitania sunk? Now the Admiralty says she was clearly warned and she was told to steer a certain course. But in the Admiralty records, the page of that signal log is missing. Off the south coast of Southern Ireland is a little signal station called Valencia, which monitored those signals. And the pages of that signal book are still there. They clearly show that the Lusitania was not told the U-20 was waiting for her. And worst of all, the only sensible message clearly identified her to anybody listening. That reads, to Alfred Vanderbilt aboard the SS Lusitania Valencia, hope you have a safe crossing, looking forward to seeing you soon. At the last minute, and without telling anyone on board the Lusitania, all those escorts were withdrawn. Either it was monumental mismanagement or a calculated risk. And I've come to the conclusion it's a calculated risk. Buried in Queenstown, far from home, the victims may therefore have been casualties of international diplomacy. Churchill, it is known, wished above all to bring the United States into the war. He wrote later, in spite of all its horror, we must regard the sinking of the Lusitania as an event most important and favorable to the Allies. At the summit, true politics and strategy are one. The maneuver which brings an ally into the field is as serviceable as that which wins a great battle. Those who died in the Lusitania were perhaps victims not just of war, but of politics. Echoes of the Lusitania began in 1941 with the USS Greer. An American destroyer, the Greer was on a mail run to Iceland. A British patrol plane spotted a German submarine and alerted the USS Greer. The Greer began to aggressively track the U-boat. The Germans, wishing to avoid detection, submerged. For two hours, the Greer and the German U-boat played a game of cat and mouse. Because the Greer was unmarked, the Germans assumed they were being pursued by a British destroyer, and the U-boat fired a torpedo at the American ship. The USS Greer set off depth charges. In spite of what 
Hitler's propaganda bureau has invented, in spite of what any American obstructionist organization may prefer to believe, I tell you the blunt fact that the German submarine fired first upon this American destroyer, Greer, without warning and with deliberate design to sink her. Just as the sinking of the Lusitania speeded America's entrance into World War I, the Greer incident provided the same two leaders, Roosevelt and Churchill, with reasons for stepping up America's hostilities toward Germany prior to World War II.